Welcome back. In our first class, we talked about vision and how important it was to develop an engaging and articulate vision story. In this class, we'll look at strategic planning, and it's the things that you need to do in order to develop the game plan to achieve the vision. So the two parts really work in, in unison. Vision has to be out there first, and then a strategic plan to help you get there. So there's countless ways of do doing strategic planning. And many organizations that we work with claim that they've got a strategic plan. But what we find often when we get into an enterprise and start to look at what they're calling strategic planning, we find that they're really doing nothing more than budgeting. And budgeting does not a strategic plan make. So in this module, we'll talk about how to develop a strategic plan that will really get you to the vision that you've articulated through your vision story. The strategic planning approach that I'm going to present to you today has been applied at all kinds of places. And I've got a list here on this slide that just a few of the ones that I've actually done myself. And I know that this methodology will work for you too. We've done it at AXA Financial, the Hartford. We've done it at Integrity Insurance, smaller regional player. We've even done it for the US Marine Corps. This methodology holds up regardless of size and location and product and service and industry. This six-step approach that I'm about to present to you will work for you as well, I'm sure. A great example of where we've done it recently is Connecticut's tax department. And I referenced that in our first class in regard to how the vision dictated changes in their operational area as it related to tax processing. What happened with that project is one that I'd like to share with you today. Once we built the vision, we recognized that we absolutely had to do a strategic plan. And what came out of the plan was a paradigm shift of great proportion. They introduced this concept of an outside-in point of view. They were saying, how do we improve the taxpayer experience in Connecticut so to gain more compliance and make life easier for both the taxpayer and the tax processing people within the state? Their strategic plan contains over two dozen projects and is highlighted by some great successes that they've already enjoyed, including one in debit cards where they use debit cards now as a way of processing uh, tax returns and giving back um, refunds. They've used tax amnesty, which again was an, an, an initiative that we defined in the strategic plan that allowed for people to pay back taxes without huge penalty and consequently gained over $40 million for the state of Connecticut through that program. And we introduced that team-based return processing that I talked about in the first module. So again, Connecticut is an example of a state agency that used this methodology to great benefit. Here's the approach. It's a six-step methodology. It includes strategic framework, baseline assessment, target definition, opportunities identification, the development of the plan, and then an, a, an administration recommendation for how to administer the plan from this time forward. That first step, strategic framework, defines a set of business principles that are necessary to manage the entity. So what they really are, when you think about a principle, is a statement of management's preferences for how they want to run the enterprise. And each principle is developed with a principle statement, followed by a rationale, and a set of implications. And you can think of the rationale, really, as being why you want to adopt the principle. And you can think of the implications as the cost that you've got to be willing to pay in order to institutionalize that principle within your enterprise. So principles are important. As I mentioned, there's a statement of management's preferences for how they want to run the enterprise. And they've got to be defined in a way that people can understand them and adopt them and use them in everyday practice. When you're organizing principles, they tend to be in one of four categories. There are people-related principles, there are process-related principles, there are technology-related principles, and then there's a set that I consider best practices. So when you're developing the strategic framework comprised of these business principles, you're going to have particular principles aimed 
at these four categories, people, process, technology, and best practices. And when you think about it, all organizations are comprised of this set. There's people doing work, the work they do is a process, the process is supported through tools, i.e. technologies, and they develop best practices for how they execute. Here's some samples from industry, and these are particular principle statements that I've used in a multitude of, of ways over the years, but they highlight kind of the substance of what a good business principle would really be about. First one, our customer-facing staff is our most important asset. There's huge rationale for why that's an important principle to adopt. The, they become the company or the organization in the eyes of your customer. The customer-facing person, of course, is the important part of an enterprise. So you've got to make sure that you focus on that. Some of the implications are that you're going to change the way you train, develop, and establish that front line. The second one, the business will aggressively leverage the emerging free agent marketplace. Why is that important? Guess what? There's an emerging free agency out there. There's a lot of people that prefer to be free agents, to be freelancers, to work on a project-by-project -project basis. There's a whole generation of new workers that don't necessarily want to be tied to a particular company and prefer to deliver their expertise on a project level. So organizations need to be able to adopt this principle and deal with the implications of this new generation of worker. And then the third example that I'll share with you today is processes will be designed independent of current work locations and physical plant. As we talked about in our first class, location independence is an important and emerging trend in the marketplace. And you're going to have to change the way you do things in order to leverage that capability. So having an, a, a principle that adopts this is absolutely crucial to making the kinds of changes that you want to make within your enterprise. Baseline assessment is the second step in the strategic planning methodology. It's about defining where you are today across the dimensions of people, process, technology, and best practices. So who does what? How do they do it? What tools do you provide to help them get the work done? And is it up to par with what one would consider acceptable industry standards? So, baseline assessment helps to characterize the current work environment. And it can drive some significant change in an enterprise once it sees itself through an objective third-party point of view. Home Depot is a place that actually sees some great strategic opportunities when it uh, brought us in to help with some baselining work. We looked at their operation and we determined that over 65% of home improvement decisions are made by the female member of a household. What was interesting was women preferred not to shop at Home Depot and they didn't feel comfortable there and didn't want to shop there because oftentimes the stores looked cluttered, they were a little dirty, there were scary things hanging overhead on pallets, there were wheelers wheeling around with all kinds of stuff that could fall and crush people. There were guys walking around with two bolts on. It really wasn't a welcoming environment. So when they compared themselves to Lowe's, who had a greeter at the door where there was a linoleum floor, it was well lit, clean store, people would walk you to the aisle that you're interested in shopping, uh, it was a totally different experience. So one of the things that we helped Home Depot discover was that you've got to make your store more female friendly to improve the flow within the store. And the strategic plan pointed to all kinds of projects and initiatives aimed at improving the customer experience and the shopping experiences in their stores. And you're still seeing some of the uh, outcomes of that strategic plan in today's Home Depot where you'll note that there's marketing materials aimed at women. You'll see that some of their print ads have pictures of women shopping for various and sundry items in the store. You'll even see that their uh, media is aimed at showing that it's family friendly. Oftentimes in their ads on television, they've got a couple walking in the store with a, a, a young child in tow pulling in a little red wagon to go shopping in the Home Depot. The message is clear. The Home Depot is female friendly. The Home Depot is 
family friendly. And that's one of the outcomes of doing a good baseline assessment during their strategic planning initiative a few years back.